George, people today are fascinated with ideas of cosmology in the universe, but tend to use words that flow over each other without precise meanings. Mm. Words like universe, multiverse, many universes, cosmos, world, all reality. People think the universe would include everything, including a spiritual world and a god if there w was one. H how would you take these words and define them so it could help us with our understanding? Well, I, I would take them as a scientist, as a cosmologist. So the universe is much bigger than we can see. That's the first kind of thing one has to realize. I would distinguish the visible universe. The visible universe is what we can see with all the telescopes. We have the Hubble Space Telescope, the COBE satellites, and so on. Now, we spend a lot of time finding its size, and that is approximately 14 billion light years across. And consequently, 14 billion years ago is where we're seeing because light travels at the speed of light. As we look out, we look back. So we see this patch of the universe, which is 14 billion light years across. And at the same time, as we look at it, we see back to 14 billion years ago. And that's what we can see. Now, it would be very strange if the universe stopped exactly <laughs> at the edge of what we can see. We, we have a horizon, which is just like on the Earth, you can only see as far as the horizon. In the universe, we can also only see as far as the horizon. That's defined as the furthest distance from which light can have reached us since the beginning of the universe. And there is no way we can see beyond that because relativity theory says nothing can travel faster than light. So this is the bounds, and so around us there's a sphere which is this size across. Now there's every reason to believe there's stuff beyond there because it would be extraordinarily strange if the universe stopped just where we can see it. So the observable universe is that the actual universe should be bigger, but we then have to start speculating what is beyond there, and the speculations about what is beyond there has changed. In the old days, when I was a graduate student, which was quite a while ago, it was assumed that as you went beyond the horizon, everything was the same. This was formalized in what was called the cosmological principle, the idea that the universe is completely homogeneous and isotropic. And this continued as far as one could imagine. In fact, people would say it carried on to infinity. Now the idea has changed, and people believe that it does continue very much the same beyond where we can see, beyond the horizon. But then, at some point, there's kind of a giant wall, and things are quite different beyond that. And there could be many, many other patches like the patch we see, this expanding universe with hundreds of millions of galaxies. But they would be different in some ways. There would be different physics out there. They might shine differently, have different lifetimes, and so on. And that this goes on for infinity is now the current sort of idea. And this is the multiverse where, the, where each yeah. area of constant physical law is one universe in a multiverse of, yeah. who knows, infinite yeah. numbers. I prefer to call it an expanding universe domain, but people talk them about as universes. In fact, as a cosmologist, to me, the universe is everything that exists. Okay, good. So then I don't like the word multiverse. I like <laughs> the idea universe. There's one universe with many different expanding universe domains. Now. The problem is we can't see those other domains, we, so we can't prove anything about them. Now, there is one option, which is actually a rather nice option. Maybe if this picture is wrong, maybe we are seeing the same patch of space-time over and over again. Now, Einstein's theory allows this to happen because space-time not only is curved, it can have a different connectivity structure. So maybe we carry out that way for a couple of hundred million light years and then suddenly we return from that side just like Pac-Man exit the screen <laughs> that line and comes back this way. And this is perfectly possible. This is what I call a small universe. So you go out that side and you come back that side just like Pac-Man did in those computer games. <laughs> in that case there would be actually many few galaxies than we appear to see. We would be seeing many images, maybe hundreds of images of the same galaxy. This is what I call a small universe. And to me, this is philosophically very attractive. And there are various ways we can try to test observationally if this is the case. It could be the case. It probably isn't, but nevertheless, that's a possibility. Why would that be attractive to you? Ah, many reasons. <laughs> it's because the philosophical re relation of humanity to the universe is completely different. In that case, we have seen everything in the universe. There's nothing unknown out there. In fact, we've seen it many different times. So for instance, our own galaxy, we would see in different directions mm -hmm. in the sky at different times of its history. Now that I really like. <laughs> so so in, by contrast with that, in the standard view, 
we've only seen a tiny fraction, in fact, maybe a zero fraction of everything. That is. So the, 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 the relation of what we know to everything is completely different in those two cases. There's another very interesting thing about this, which is can we say what's going to happen in 100 years' time? Now, in the standard cosmology picture, as we age, which physically, as a cosmologist, we think is moving up our word line in space-time, we're seeing new bits of the universe which we've never seen before. Something totally unexpected could happen. Maybe there could be a huge wall suddenly come into view emitting gravitational waves. They could be so strong they would destroy the Earth. Okay? <laughs> that, that cannot happen in the case of the small uh -huh. universe because we've seen everything there is. There are no surprises out there uh -huh. ever waiting for us because we've seen all there is. Don't you like surprises? <laughs> Not that one. <laughs> <laughs> Not that one, right. <laughs> so, so it's just like on this Earth, in the old days when Columbus and so on said, well, we'd only seen a bit of the Earth, but then we saw the whole of the surface of the Earth. Now, you can still examine in more detail what lies on the surface of the Earth, but basically we've seen all the surface of the Earth. And that would be the case in a small universe. In the other case, we've seen everything within our horizon, but the horizon is expanding and it's expanding into the unknown and always will be unknown. Many cosmologists today have a whole series of different mechanisms for generating these yep. either new domains within the large universe or many universes that depending upon your yep. mechanism. It could be quantum mechanical, yep. it could be chaotic inflation theory, yep. uh, a whole series of different different yep. mechanisms. Uh, do you favor one over the other or, do you, or, do you th or are <laughs> they all sort of in the same well, character? Um, I don't like the quantum many worlds picture for a whole lot of reasons. But my view across all of this is the following. All of these mechanisms which are proposed are good physical hypotheses, but they are all untested. And one must be extremely clear, when people make the claim, as some do, it is inevitable the multiverse exists. They're basing that on their hypotheses about physics. Those hypotheses are not tested. They have not been tested in the laboratory, and they probably never will be testable in the laboratory. So this is what I would call speculator physics. It's a really good speculation as what yeah. physics may be, but it is not provable, it's not testable. We can only test things in laboratories or in particle accelerators on Earth. What is happening in cosmology, you're extrapolating from the known to the unknown, and you're extrapolating by vast amounts. We hope that extrapolation is correct, but we cannot prove it is correct. And furthermore, different people make different extrapolations. So when you get back to the kinds of physics which may have underlain the really early universe, way, way back to the parts we can't see because it was opaque then, we are again guessing about those physics. Highly sophisticated guesses, but they are not tested, they are not proven, and this extrapolation we're making could be quite wrong. Some would say that one of the underlying motivations for postulating the multiverse, many different universes, mm -hmm is dealing with the fine-tuning problem yes. that we find in ours. Absolutely. That unless you have a multi-universe, yeah. the only other alternative, unless you're going to get a, an absolute necessity mathematical equation, which seems to be more and more difficult to get, yeah. the only other alternative is some sort of a theological uh, answer. Yeah. And because uh, some are, are not disposed to that, <laughs> right. the multiverse yeah. uh, is a natural yeah. uh, consequence. I want to comment on two of those. Firstly, one other option is just pure chance. Now, I don't mean by that it was probable. I mean, that is just the way it happened. Yes. And we just lucked out. Brute, brute fact. Brute fact. Now. The second possibility you said was maybe physics is unique and there isn't this variation yeah. in physics. Actually, I think that makes the problem a lot worse. Now, the reason is the following. We know the present-day particle physics, the standard model, has got a whole lot of adjustable parameters, the masses of certain particles, the strength of certain forces. Right. We know that most of the values in the parameter space will not allow life to exist because the, the, the particle physics here has to underlie the emergence of complexity, and in many cases it won't be possible. If the forces are too strong, you won't get atoms, everything will have punched, you, you won't get complex atoms, everything will simply be um, um, die protons stuck together. If it's too weak, you won't get atoms at all, and so on and so on. You've got to get the parameters here right now. If the parameters here in the standard model of particle physics come from some underlying fundamental theory which leads to a unique value here, 
there is a great danger if you start off with some fundamental principles, symmetry principles, variational principles, and so on, and you derive your standard model of particle physics, there's a great danger you will not end up in the area here which allows life to exist over there. And in fact, if there was such a unique thing, it would have to be true. It ended you up in this very small part here, which and that would be a much bigger mystery, because then in some sense, the image of life would be written in to those symmetry principles and abstract principles over there. And to me, that would actually be a bigger mm. mystery. <laughs> so to me, it's a much more congenial idea that these it is not a uniqueness from there, that there is a variety of possibilities there. These are realized in a multiverse, the different parts and then some parts allow life to exist and others don't. So I think that is a very good explanation. But I want to emphasize that I regard this as a philosophical explanation rather than a scientific one for the following reason. In my view, science, the core feature of science is it can be tested and verified, okay? And in this case, the existence of those other domains cannot be tested directly because we can't see them. In fact, we have no causal contact with them at the present time. We could very legitimately deduce they existed if we had verified those laws of physics which have been claimed, but those are also unverified. So I regard science as being centered on the idea of confirmation and verifiability. And these give very good explanatory patterns, and they are plausible explanatory patterns, but I would say that this is a metaphysical explanation of a scientific nature plausible one, <laughs> but nevertheless it isn't testable and it will remain metaphysical because it can't be tested. At the end of the day, when you reflect upon this at night, <laughs> not having to write some paper that other people will read, yeah. which, which do you favor? I am, as I think is known, of a theistic inclination, but the reason for that is not because of the multiverse and so on. It is partly because of the fine-tuning, because, as you've said, one of the options here is a theistic one. The whole thing was intended to be that way. But because I think if you want to understand the deep nature of the universe, as well as taking into account astronomical observations, you must take other data, and the other data you must take into account is the data of everyday life. <laughs> the fact that we exist is something that must be taken into account, but also the kinds of experiences we have. And those experiences include things like apprehensions of beauty, apprehensions of an, um, a moral order, and this kind of thing. And I think if you want to argue about the metaphysics of the universe, that is experience which is also relevant in understanding the metaphysics of the universe as well as the astronomical data.